we are fighters for truth, justice, and the American way. Is it rice? Is it maggots? Is it rice? Oh, ha ha! Michael's not making good choices. Do the vampires have real feelings? Hello and welcome to the Untitled Gen X Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the pop culture that raised us. I'm Lori, a writer and pop culture lover who's thrilled to welcome the one, the only, Eric J. Gennard to discuss the film that proves there's nothing sexier than the clandestine allure of immortality. Yes, I'm talking about 1987's cult classic, The Lost Boys. But before we get into the darkness of it all, I'd like to shine a light on the incomparable Eric J. Gennard. Eric is an award-winning writer of dark and speculative fiction. He also runs Dark Moon Books, a publisher of unusual and invigorating dark fiction. He's a technical writer and college professor, in addition to being an incredible husband and loving father of two kids, two dogs, and a terrarium of mischievous beetles. To which I have to ask you, Eric, how did you ever have time to join me on the podcast? (laughs) quarantine that's a, I, <laughs> the benefit of quarantine yeah absolutely yeah well i have to let our audience know that i met you our freshman year of high school at a halloween party you my friend were dressed in lederhosen do you remember the party <laughs> oh absolutely yeah i i still got an uh, extra pair of lederhosen that i like <laughs> to sport around the house you know when i'm feeling frisky <laughs> Oh, so, well, that, that's where I met my wife at. So naturally, that's the memory that, that we share and discuss frequently. So I, I remember at, at Michelle's house. Yes, at Michelle's house. And uh, just for the listener, Eric is married to one of my very best friends. And so I've had the pleasure of knowing Eric for a very long time, which makes me think, you know, Eric, maybe you and I have a little bit of vampire in both of us because we don't look a day over 20 and we have known each other (laughs) forever. Oh, thank God the video isn't showing. So nobody (laughs) can dispute that fact, at least for me. You certainly don't, but man, I'm looking at myself on on the video and I see like the wrinkle lines around my face. (laughs) (laughs) So the fact that, you know, we met at a Halloween party and this, of course, paired with your mastery of horror fiction made The Lost Boys the perfect choice. So I have to ask you, do you remember the first time you saw this film? To be perfectly honest, I, I do not remember the first time. I was in my teenage years, my, my late teenage years. I mean, I, I have a general sense of the time frame. Right, so in my household, we did not watch horror movies. You know, a little bit more of a conservative household. Okay. You know, back in the day. But of course, you know, I'd go to neighbors' houses or friends' houses. Yep. And that's when the horror movies would come out. And a lot of times, unfortunately, is, you know, in my, my later teen years, I would we'd have still have slumber parties with friends. So I... I do remember frequently going to friends' houses and at, at midnight with like four or five guys sitting around and, you know, out pops the VHS cassette and <laughs> everybody course. all ooh and awe over the cover and say, man, this looks amazing. And right. Secretly, I'm kind of like biting my nails because ah, I'm not used to horror movies and I, I still do get scared by uh, horror flicks. That's so wild to me, Eric. I mean, you aren't a published author of horror fiction. You are so involved in the horror fiction culture. Were you reading horror novels as a kid? Yes. Okay. So you weren't necessarily watching this on film, but were you reading Stephen King? Were you just deeply involved in that? And that was okay in your household? Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird. We, I I think it was probably my my mom maybe kind of oversaw what we saw on TV a, a little bit, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. The imagery of it. Sure. I, I was really involved in my church as well. So you okay. know, we, we had a little bit more of the religious conservative values in the household. Right. But I was an avid reader and okay. I love, and I loved horror fiction. And it happened to be that my dad read Stephen King books and he read Dean Koontz books and yeah. Anne Rice. And his mother, my grandmother, also was an avid reader of Dean Cooth and Stephen King. Okay. And the books would get passed down to me. But for stories that made an impact on my life, you know, as a kid in elementary school, I loved war and explosions. And the very first story, my, my dad pulled out a Stephen King collection 
and said, you know, Eric, this is horror and you, uh, you, it's not really age appropriate, but there's a short story in here about army men that come to life. And he let me read it. And I love that story to this day called like battleground. Okay. But based off of that short story, I loved it so much that I was familiar with the name of Stephen King because of that. And then lo and behold, the very next year that we had like scholastic book order forums coming around. Best day ever. Oh, I tell you what, man, those are the greatest t- days. Remember what those scholastic book orders? I know. But yeah, I remember seeing like The Eyes of the Dragon, which is a fantasy novel by Stephen King. And it was actually in Scholastic, which Scholastic oh, isn't normally going to, no. it's never going to promote adult horror. But The Eyes of the Dragon was written to a middle grade audience, a fantasy okay. audience. And I just saw that and thought, man, this is like a big name adult author. And I want to read this book because I loved this story that, that I had read. Mm-hmm. And I always looked at horror when I read horror fiction growing up through my teen years, you know, I would read some like the raunchiest horror that that would come around. But horror books would never scare me. I never felt fright reading because they were always exciting to me. And this is how I always justify um, my love for horror. When I watch horror movies, especially in my younger years, when I first started getting into them, they would actively scare me and I would have nightmares from them. And I remember seeing like Scooby-Doo cartoons as a kid and being horrified just in shock and tears because they would have these like cartoon monsters running around. Wow. And at the same time, you're reading Stephen King and Dean Coons. Yeah, because in these books, it's all about your imagination. And so my imagination wouldn't necessarily form the the horrific things that I would see forced upon me. When you look at a visual image in the shows, it's forced upon you. This is exactly what's happening. And you have a little bit of room of imagination, but but not much because you're you're embracing it that as part of your reality at that moment. Right. But then when you're reading it, you're making the story your own. And 10 people can read the same story and each person walk away with a different visual and a different experience of of how they interacted in this scene. Uh And so generally in horror stories, Stephen King, Dean Coots, these are all the the professional writers and they're the bestsellers that are on the bookshelves because generally their stories, the good guy still wins at the end. Ah. So it still promotes the same values of classic literature, kids' stories, adventure films. The good guy wins. When you look at movies these days, sometimes like if you see like the Saw franchise, the bad guy wins. And it drives me insane. I hate movies that the bad guy wins. It's the optimist in you. Yes. And, and I have like these certain expectations of being raised from childhood, right? We have the values of if you act noble and you act kind to other people, you know, that's going to come back. And at the end of the day, karmic justice will prevail. And the good guy should win. Right. You know, the cowboy dressed in white, he's going to defeat the bad guy dressed in black every time these books, the monster comes along and slaughters and kills hundreds of people and people are freaked out and oh my God, the world is going to end. But then suddenly this one nondescript boy, and if it's a Dean Coons book, his golden retriever comes along for the ride. And then they (laughs) magically, they somehow defeat the bad guy because, you know, intrinsically they were good enough and they were able to overcome all of these obstacles. And really you know, it's like this cautionary tale that you're able to overcome the impossibilities in life and just defeat things that were the odds are just completely stacked against you. And we see that in this film, uh-huh. right? The good guys went out in the nook, the trusty dog that's along for the ride. Yes, they got like, like a whole list. The formula. Uh, they check mark everything. They have kids. They have funny kids too. They do. They bring in so many cultural references. They got dogs. They got the cranky old kook grandparents. The eclectic Uh, grandpa. Yeah, 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 it's true. So this film was released on July 31st, 1987. The budget was $8.5 million, and it made over $32.2 million in the box office. So it did quite well. This film was directed by Joel Schumacher. And we know Joel Schumacher from St. Elmo's Fire, Flatliners, Dying Young, of course, these came later, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. What's interesting about this film, though, is it was originally going to be directed by Richard Donner. And Richard Donner, we know from Superman, The Goonies, Scrooged, The Omen, like Lethal Weapons 1 through 4. 
And the original screenplay of this was written by Janice Fisher and James Jeremias. In the original version, the characters were played by 13 to 14 year olds with the Frog Brothers as, quote, chubby eight year old Cub Scouts. So this was actually going to be a film geared towards kids. Donner was involved in so many other projects at the time, though, that he had to kind of bow out and they offered Joel Schumacher the gig. And he was like, okay, yeah, I'll take it. But I want to make the film sexier and more stylized. So this is when he enlisted the help of screenwriter Jeffrey Bohm, who's best known for Inner Space, uh, Lethal Weapons 2 and 3, and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. He brought him in to rework the script for like an older audience. So this really was sort of the birth of the teenage vampire movement. So it it was going to be a very different film. It was sort of supposed to be very Goonie-esque. Then, of course, Corey Feldman was in The Goonies also. Yeah, I, I could see there's there's still a lot of comparisons to the Goonies carrying over. This is a it's a great lead off. If you like the Goonies, you're going to you're going to love the Lost Boys. It's just it's a little bit edgier. Sure. You know, it sprays blood everywhere right. throughout. But you still have these quirky little kids that they want to take on the, the establishment. And they're they're basically going on this big adventure in, in a new realm. And they put together the weapons that they're going to use against the bad guys based Mm -hmm. on the mythology that they're familiar with. And that mythology comes from comic books. Yes. Now, were you a big comic book reader as a kid? Oh yeah. I was huge, huge into comic books. That was a, such a big part of my childhood, man. TV wasn't really allowed after school. I would read books. I'd read comics and I was a fan of just so many. Were you interested in horror comics? No, I tended to be interested. Again, the my belief in the good guy is going to win. I tended to be a big, bigger fan of the vigilante style comic books. I see. And those are the ones where they're single characters rather than working together as a team. Um, so things like The Punisher and Swamp Thing and Jonah Hex. These are the adventures where they would basically, they, they would take on, on the world pretty much by themselves. Interesting. And so in terms of this film and the overall themes, it was actually inspired by the story of Peter Pan and uh-huh. the idea of never growing up, hence the film's title, The Lost Boys. So it's this idea of immortality in your youth. Do you see this a lot in the horror fiction that you read? this overarching theme of immortality? I, I would say the, the overarching theme of immortality is common, but the way that it's used varies very greatly because okay. I, I like to write about immortality, but a lot of times you can look at that in terms of ghosts. You know, ghosts may be a form of immortality because if we look at a ghost, they're frozen in time and they're no longer going to age at the point of their demise. So if they died as a 10-year-old and they come back as a ghost, they are thus a 10-year-old in that form based on whatever ghost rules accompany that particular (laughs) work of fiction. Okay. And then immortality can be looked at, you know, in terms of of photographs and memories and and the way that you're being carried on by how you're you're spoken of and the way that that you're thought just as much as if you're a vampire. But a lot of it is, is the fantasy because a thought for general society and culture, just humanity, that what comes after we die um, you know, at what point is there an end? And is there some great continuation? You know, deep down inside, you hope that there's something else that's going to go on. And, and ultimately, there's some greater meaning. But it begs the question, therefore, if there is a continuance, how does that continuance affect us? And how are we going to look? Or how are we going to form? Will we still have our memories? Will we still have our relationships? Will we still have our our hopes and our dreams and be able to continually try to realize those and what comes next. So I think of the background of our consciousness that's just kind of built in as a very natural thought process that some people may spend more time and energy considering those things. You know, some people may not, you may have a, just a, a very diehard religious belief that there's, you know, at that end you're for becoming a, a piece of energy or an, an angel or some sort of mm-hmm. spiritual guardian 
but it's the same thing. You know, are, are we still going to have like our, our sense of, of what we held dear and the values that we believed in? Are, are they going to be justified in the great hereafter? I, I don't know if I kind of went way off topic on, on what no, you're asking. No, it's but- fascinating. It's fascinating to consider too, because this film spawned two sequels, but you wonder whatever happened to David and his, you know, gang of vampire misfits, were they truly gone, gone? I didn't watch the sequels, but what happens hereafter, even with them, you know, what's up with Max? I have to ask those questions when the, you know, the good guys that went out went on to live their mortal, happy lives. They were good people, whatever, you know, life went on in Santa Carla, but for the vampires, even is that the end when you kill a monster? Is that the end? Or do they just come back as a different energy form? What happens? Well, from a writer's point of view, anything can happen. Anything can happen. You make your own rules. You make your own rules. Just as long as you abide by those rules in the universe that you're writing in, you can absolutely bring back any vampire or any monster Um, Just using your imaginations. Honestly, they've been doing that forever in soap opera life. <laughs> and soap opera culture, you know, that's been going on since the dawn of the ages. So it kind of makes sense, right? Is there any greater horror than soap opera drama? No, no, there is not. That shit is scarier than anything you write, Eric. Yes, everything is tense. I'm going down to the grocery store and I'm going to buy a banana. It never like lets you down. No, it is a wild ride from start to finish. Yes. That's why anything goes as long as you follow the same rules in your own universe, but even those rules are always flexible. Oh my gosh, it's so true. Okay, so let's get into the film. Cool. We open on a very happening boardwalk at night and we see a carousel. And on that carousel is a teenage couple. And this is when we're introduced to David, played by Kiefer Sutherland. So let's talk about Kiefer Sutherland for a second. Up until this point, he had only been in a few TV movies and films you know, most notably 1986's Stand By Me, mm-hmm. equally menacing in that one. He's great in everything. Isn't he though? I mean, we know him now, obviously from 24 and designated survivor and like a million other things. So we see him in his black leather, in his mulleted, like sinister glory. And he goes up to the young woman and he touches her face. Now he's got a whole gothic look. He looks like, you know, Hot Topic threw up all over him. So he's all in black. He's got that signature dangle earring and those motorcycle gloves. And I have a little bit of trivia about those gloves. So according to MovieWeb, the gloves were more than just a style choice. He had to wear them to conceal a cast on his wrist Ah. because he broke his wrist screwing around on his motorcycle. So it completed the look. It's very cool. Yeah, it definitely works out. He would not have been the same character without the the fingerless Michael Jackson era black leather gloves. Yes, it was very sort of John Bender from Breakfast Club, too. It was the same sort of like, you know, tough guy vibe. Yeah. Man, I I didn't think of that comparison. But yeah, Bender, he could have stepped right into the role of one of of the vampires and fit right in. Right in. He had the scowl, the smirk. And the punchy one-line dialogue. Man, he's razor sharp. Yeah. Right? (laughs) Total typecast. Yeah. So the boyfriend of this girl, you know, he's kind of upset. Like, what do I do? And then a security guard approaches David and his crew. And he tells him, I told you to stay off the boardwalk. They leave. But then later, when the security guard is walking to his car, We see him look up terrified. There's, you know, this horrible, scary sound and he looks like something's coming for him and whatever it is, it gets him. So this is when we cut to a mom and her two sons traveling by car to their new home in Santa Carla, California. We see scenes of the town. It's a beach town. There's punks and hippies and surfers and graffiti and just, it's a very sort of like Venice beach vibe. I've never really spent time in Santa Cruz where this was filmed, but maybe it's a very Santa Cruz vibe. There was a casting call put out in Santa Cruz for all kinds of people to complete this scene around the beach. And they were asking for like families and, and 
people who live on the streets and punks and radical people. And 2,000 people were hired for what at the time was the largest film production in Santa Cruz. But the mom is played by Diane Weist. And we know her from Footloose, Hannah and her sisters, and Edward Scissorhands, and a bunch of other stuff. And she's been nominated for Best Supporting Actress three times, and she's won twice. So she's kind of a big deal. Wow. Her sons include Michael, played by Jason Patrick, and he's known for Sleepers and Speed 2, and younger Sam, played by Corey Haim, known for Lucas, Murphy's Romance, and the Corey and Corey films of the 80s. So it's a mom and her two sons. We learn that she's divorced and they arrive at their grandpa's house. And grandpa, like we were talking about, he's a real character. He's super into taxidermy. He's just kind of like this wild, weird, crazy guy. So what were your thoughts on grandpa? He was a kook. <laughs> Loved he's, him. Yeah, he's very, very cantankerous. He was kind of a stereotype. I liked him. He was kind of a flat character. Yeah, I agree. This, this like kind of like they just kind of threw in all these little little jokey things about him as an ex hippie living on there on the outskirts of the beach, and pretty much anything goes as long as you follow his rules, his his yeah. crazy grandpa rules. <laughs> so. He's created his own little universe there yeah. in that house. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame the kids for like first sight saying. You know, I want to go back to Phoenix. Yeah, I I don't really like it here. I feel a little bit weird at grandpa's house. (laughs) Okay, so Lucy and her sons, they head to the boardwalk at night to check out the scene. Of course, we see lots of colorful characters. There's a lot of missing people posters. So you're like, okay, there's something going on here in this town. This is when, Eric, this is when we get to feast our eyes and ears on the wonder and spectacle of the super buff and shirtless, oiled up, mulleted, sexy <laughs> sax man in his leather jock strap and chains. Of course, we are talking about Tim Capello performing, I still believe. Oh my God, oh, yeah. this is so epic. He has built a career off of that single scene. Yes. I mean, okay. I will say this. The song is so good. It's on my exercise playlist. (laughs) I still listen to it like nearly every day. The song is fantastic. But you see this guy, he's so buff and oiled and just wearing so many chains and this long hair. Like it is a look. (laughs) But Lord, he had flames coming out of his saxophone. I mean, you can't get any more, any more punk rock than that. That was like fire and brimstone like it was such a mood and a vibe yes and you turned me on to the fact that snl did a digital short called the curse based on tim capello and in this digital short i will link to it in the show notes we get a shirtless suspended sexy john ham playing the sexy sax man and it it was so funny like laugh out loud hilarious and it gets funnier it's one of the it's one of those like rare gems of short clips it just gets funnier and funnier every time you watch it you watch it the second time and like you know the setup now and you know what to expect and it makes it even funnier just watching the reactions of of the characters it is so good and if you're a fan of the lost boys if you're a fan of tim capello you will certainly appreciate this digital Uh. short If you're a fan of laughing. If you are a fan of life at all, you need to watch (laughs) this. So good. So according to Mental Floss, sexy sax man, Tim Capello, trained at the New England Conservatory of Music. And he did that after he dropped out of school at 15. And he has performed with big, big names like Peter Gabriel and Carly Simon. And he toured with Tina Turner for more than 15 years. So, I mean, he's, he's real deal. Like you look at him and it seems like a joke. He's not a joke. He's the real deal, but people don't know that know him for touring for Tina Turner. They know him for the 32nd clip of in lost boys. There is no such thing as small actors. Like he made 
the most of his part. Yeah. I could watch that on a loop all day long and not get bored. I feel like his hips were like this, the movie just suddenly went three dimensional because his <laughs> hips were thrusting off screen right into my face. And you were like, I am strangely here for this. I don't know why. I'm not I don't know what bothered it says about it. me. But you know what? Let's watch it again. And it was also, it's the music. The music is, I mean, there's fire in the background, but the music is fire and it's mesmerizing. And honestly, like, okay, so Michael's there, right? Right. And he's grooving to Tim Capello and he sees the beautiful star who is also grooving to Tim Capello. And star is played by Jamie Gertz. And interestingly, Jamie Gertz was recommended for this role by Jason Patrick, even though Joel Schumacher actually wanted to cast a wafy blonde, but uh, Jamie Gertz got it. And we know her from Less Than Zero, 16 Candles, Square Pegs. She was in Twister. She's beautiful. Yeah, she is. She's great in this film. So I could see why he was mesmerized by her. She was stunning. So they lock eyes as the music swells and she runs away. It's very dramatic. Meanwhile, Mom Lucy makes her way into a video store. And this is where she meets Max. Max is the owner of the video store, and he's played by Edward Herman. Now, we know Edward Herman from The Electric Grandmother. Kate and I covered Ray Bradbury's Electric Grandmother in season one. You really ought to listen to that episode. But we also know him from Overboard. And, of course, he played Richard Gilmore in The Gilmore Girls. And don't forget the the Munsters. He was he was in the Munsters movie. He was in the Munsters movie? Herman Munster. Wasn't that Fred Gwynn? They changed rules in one of the other, the later remakes. I didn't know that. I always remember that because his name, it was Edward Herman played Herman Munster. And it, one of those mnemonic memories that you're just like, ah, I remember Herman and Herman. And you will remember that for the rest of your life. Oh, see? yeah. I'll be sitting with dementia on the retirement <laughs> home. I'm like, hey, I don't know my name, but you know, Edward Herman and Herman Munster, the same person. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is when David and his, you know, little moto gang go into the video store and Max sternly tells them, I told you not to come in here anymore. And I'll tell you, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, Max is going to get it from the vampires. He's going to be just like the security guard. He's another one of these, like, you follow the rules and the stick up the ass kind of a demeanor. Oh, yeah, you're going down. I like the vampires because they're kind of taking over the establishment. Dude, that, that security guard was an a-hole. Was he, though? Like, honestly. He didn't have to put the baton around like Kiefer Sutherland's neck, give him a choke out versus approaching with his hands up like, hey, boys, why don't you go take a step out of here? Oh, OK. So it was it was his his energy and his approach. It wasn't that he asked them to leave because I was thinking if you were on a carousel with your wife. And a motorcycle, like scary looking gothic dude came up to her and touched her face. You would want someone to like, get him out of here. You wouldn't want to have to be the guy. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, the whole approach though, I mean, you're a, you're a police officer or guard. You could step up, you know, man to man with your, your chest down saying, boys, <laughs> well, I'm representing the law. This is really inappropriate. I'm giving you a warning before I escalate things. I'm not just going to creep up and like give you a choke out with a baton around your neck. I'm like, what kind of a move is that? You don't know what has transpired all this time. This security guard may have given him 50,000 chances. Probably has to tell that dude every night, stop touching girls' faces on the carousel. (laughs) Maybe this was the last straw for that poor guy. We don't know his backstory, Eric. You're right. I, I don't know. Or it could be totally the, the other way around. You know, this this guy is like normally the security guard is just this monster to, to everybody. <laughs> every person that's like, oh, I saw you throw a piece of litter on the ground. He runs up behind him and like puts him in a chokehold with a baton oh, around the, around he's the window. He's that side. guy. Maybe he's like just he's killed people <gasps> like doing this move and he's like he's had to throw them into unmarked graves and he's He's just like secretly skulking around like, but who can I creep up on next time? And he gets like his jollies off. Oh, like too much power. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so maybe David and his vampire peeps were doing us all a favor. They're, They're the vigilante crew because they've been watching. Well, this now becomes a very different film because then if we take it in that regard, 
then the good guys didn't end up winning. Yeah, because if you look at it, the surf Nazis, ultimately, even by their name, the, the other crowd, they were just a bunch of partying thugs as well. So the vampire crew, they cleaned house. Oh. You know, they, they got rid of these other, they really got rid of a lot of bad elements. Maybe and they were doing the Lord's work and we didn't realize. Yeah. yeah. This is an interesting theory. We could write some like fan fiction about this, like going the other way. Yes. From the point of view of David. Okay, this is your next assignment, Eric. You get right on that. I'm inspired. You're inspired, yes. So Lucy finds a lost kid, and this is why she goes into the video store. And so Max is like, oh, look at this caring woman worried about this little child. And and so they get to talking, and she reveals that you know she's new to town, and she's basically looking for a job. And Max is like, oh, hey. I've got this here video store. Want to come work for me? So now Lucy is an employee at Max's video store. So we cut back to Michael and Sam walking along the boardwalk as Michael looks for Star because they had a moment. So he catches up to her, but it's clear that she is somehow connected to David and this crew. Bummer. Sam ends up in a bookstore where he meets the Frog Brothers. Edgar, played by Corey Feldman in his full Rambo gear, yes. and Alan. And of course, we know Corey Feldman from The Goonies, Stand By Me, Friday the 13th, and of course, all the Corey movies of the 1980s. And, and, and the infamous 1980s drug PSA. Kate and I did an episode on drug PSAs from the 80s. You guys should check it out. We talk all about Corey Feldman's PSA. It's pretty epic. <laughs> so- so this is a fun little bit of trivia. The Frog Brothers, Edgar and Allen, they were named to be, you know, a reference to Edgar Allan Poe, the famous writer and poet of dark and detective fiction. Oh, I did not grasp that. There you go. In regard to the character of Edgar Frog, Feldman said of Schumacher, quote, Basically, he gave me an order to go out and rent all the Stallone movies and all the Chuck Norris movies, stuff like Rambo and First Blood and Missing in Action. Schumacher said, this is your character. I want you to meld all of these guys together and make something out of it. So I did. It's funny because, you know, he is dressed in his full like Rambo gear and he talked throughout the film. Like yeah. this. <laughs> this is how he talked. Da, 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 da. Yeah. yeah. So this film actually is the very first film that the two Corys starred in together. And it was the first of many to come. Okay. So the Frog Brothers questioned Sam, like, what are you doing here? Who are you? What's your story? And they proclaim themselves to be vampire hunters. And Edgar says, we are fighters. No, we are fighters for truth, justice, and the American way. <laughs> and they give Sam a horror comic called Vampire Hunters, and it is designed to instruct him on like how to protect himself should he need it. And they write their phone number on the back of the comic, you know, just in case he needs it. This is kind of fun, though. The comic book store that they're in, in Santa Cruz, it is called the Atlantis Fantasy World Comic Book Store, and it is owned by Joe Ferreira II. And he still has the original number one issue of Vampires Everywhere. And it's a comic that Sam reads in the film. And the comic was made specifically for the film and signed by the entire cast. Oh, cool. And Joe Ferreira II, the owner, he allows visitors and shoppers and fans of the film to come in and take a picture with it. So you can do that in Santa Cruz. It's pretty oh, cool. Oh, sweet. So if you're a Lost Boy stan, go check it out. So Michael sees Star get on the back of David's bike and uh, David gives him like kind of a creepy smile and they ride off. Later, Michael's finally able to talk with Star and he invites her to go out to like, let's go get something to eat. And this is when David appears and provokes Michael. He's like, hey, why don't you like follow us? Come along. And he's like, look, all you got to do is keep up with us. I don't really know why Michael decides, yeah, I'm going to follow this group of like biker, scary guys. I know he's into star, like I get it, but clearly star is involved with David. So what do you think inspires him to do that? Is it just like pride? I, all right. So I have to completely agree with you because this is, it's really funny. Everything else that's happened in the movie, kind of silly, kind of out there. 
but you're like, yeah, I could go along with it. I cannot suspend my disbelief at this moment. It's ridiculous on two levels. You're the leader of the biker gang. This is your chick. And here's some stranger, some bro, trying to put <laughs> moves on your girl. And you're like, hey, man, why don't you just come roll with us? No. Kiefer Sutherland, like, he shows his dominance by saying, star, get on my bike. Right. She acquiesces and says, yes, I will. And then Kiefer Sutherland gives the little smirk, like, ha ha, I win. In real life, you give a little flip off to somebody, you take off. You're not like, yeah, bro, that was a challenge and I won. But man, why don't I give you a second opportunity to kind of step up and try to steal my girl? Well, okay. I feel like he invited Michael along because I don't know if he was trying to get Michael to join their, you know, vampire movement or if it was we could feast on this dude. So, hey, why don't you just come along? Like, yeah, maybe it was either one of those things. What I don't understand is why Michael would go. Like, I get it. You're new to Santa Carla. Maybe you want to make some friends, but are these the friends you really want to make? Like, does this seem like a good idea? You haven't started school yet. You're not sitting at the lunch tables alone. I don't understand. Like, I I get it. You like Star, but Star is connected to this dude and he looks kind of scary as hell. Like, maybe we don't want to get on this guy's bad side. I just don't know what inspires Michael to go other than you're kind of provoking me. I'm up for the challenge. You've insulted my pride. Like I have to prove something to you. I don't know what would inspire him to actually go. Like, why are you so dumb? Later on, it's justified. But right to your point, it's really never justified why Jason Patrick accepts the invitation because you are a stranger and there's this biker gang and you know only bad things are going to happen to you. And just to say like, yeah, you know what? Let's just go off. It's late at night. I don't really know this town because I just moved here. Right. Yeah, let's go. Let's just go cruising with a bunch of strangers off into like some unknown realm. And the strangers obviously know I was trying to pick up on his chick. And who's going to just put themselves like further into that and say, yeah, I want to see where this is going to go. I mean, Michael would. It doesn't make sense. But anyway, we have to move the plot along. So, okay, fine. He decides to go. And this is when they ride on the beach, like super fast while Lost in the Shadows plays. They're riding so fast and it's getting like darker and foggier and it's really hard to see the road and it's getting super dangerous and Michael's getting scared and all the vampires are like, woohoo, yeah, woo, this is awesome. And Michael, he gets the sense like, I'm going to fucking die. And so he stops right in the nick of time. He finds himself at the edge of a cliff. With water below, he is so pissed and he goes and he charges after David. I mean, David doesn't kill him. David's like, hey, come into our home. (laughs) Let let me invite you in. He's just toying with him. Yeah, so he invites him into their home that it's like within a cave. It was once a fancy hotel that's now sunken. And the space is cool. It's weird. It's a cross between like Disneyland's Haunted Mansion and hot topic <laughs> and a dorm room and like maybe an urban outfitters. Like it's a whole, it's, it's a whole scene and there's tapestries everywhere, candles and candelabras, that giant image of Jim Morrison. Yeah. A nice homage. A nice homage. So, you know, interestingly, they played people are strange throughout the film. It's not actually the doors version. It was, Recorded by Echo and the Bunnymen. Echo and the Bunnymen did it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, dare I say, I like their version better. Oh, eh, I said it. Blasphemy. I like it. There's nothing wrong with it. But man, I was such a huge Doors fan. I love classic you? rock. Of the, oh, yeah. My brother and I both had like the, the Doors um, banners in our rooms. And I had, the, I had the big portrait of the Jim Morrison when he has the little Indian CB necklace. Yes. And shirtless with his arms outstretched. I'd wake up to that in my room. So your room was basically a vampire lair. Oh, if I'm going to show you photographs of my room. It totally was like that. I had like the lava lamps. Stop. Just kinds of junk every like clean, not, not like trash junk, but just collectibles and sculptures and artwork and like musical instruments. And I don't know if we're going to talk about like the background vibe or the scene or the atmosphere of the movie later on in the movie. No, let's talk about it. Yes. All right. So this is what appealed to me most about the Lost Boys. So regardless of the vampires or the horror or the adventure, 
Laura, you remember me in high school. I was a hippie. Oh yeah, for sure. 100% you guys. We were in the, in the nineties grunge era and I embraced that grunge culture. I wore my wetsuit to school a couple of times. I wore a dress to school. You were so funky, Eric. You had a, I might be wrong. Maybe it wasn't a teddy bear. It was my backpack. (laughs) It was a teddy bear backpack. You opened the teddy bear and then that's where Eric put all of his little, you know, honors English books. Eric was an (laughs) honors student. He was so smart and he was a drama student and he was so quirky and Eric was just like a one man party. And I was still triple varsity sport, soccer, swimming, water polo, free baseball before that. But anyway, I'm done tooting my own horn, but badass hippie. Dude, I was huge into this bohemian grunge hippie culture. And that's, that's what the music I listened to. The idea of expanding your mind while I was still drug free, because I never, because I was also very healthy and I had this religious background and never used a drug in my life, but all my friends did. I would hang out with all my friends and they'd be doped out of their minds on, on every illicit substance that, that you can imagine. Um, all growing up, everybody used dope around me, but I didn't, but I loved the environment of it. And I loved like the tide eyes and the floating colors and just thinking outside of the box. And that's what the Lost Boys was to me, because there's just so much going on in the background in that sunken, crazy, bohemian um, layer that they have. I'm like, man, to me, I'm like, dude, that is the ultimate, ultimate hideaway because it's set aside from everybody else. It's set aside from the world. It's where they can be themselves without these prying eyes coming down to judge them. But when they're by themselves, it's not a typical vampire cave. It's just not filled with stalactites and stalagmites. It's filled with culture. It's filled with the memories and the remnants of like previous eras and the generations. And there's so much to do. They've got throne rooms and banquet tables and they've got music going on. And it's just this nonstop party. And it's just another takeaway from the whole, the whole environment of the city of Santa Carla which Santa Carla, when I watched this movie, that was like my dream. Like I thought in my mind, like, dude, that's where I want to live my life is a place like Santa Carla because anything goes in Santa Carla. They've got the old hippies laying all all sprawled out in the comic stores and on the boardwalk. They're sitting there playing their guitars. They got a vibrant punk scene. Everybody are out there. And it's just like it's San Francisco, Height Ashbury. There's so much like life going on and it's all this progressive thinking but it still has the sensibility of comic books and video movie rentals. And it's just so kind of cool because even though anything goes, you still have a lot of these traditional values at play along with the non-traditional values, such as the broken families. And right. It's like a rebel without a cause vibe. Everybody's still trying to find their own way kind of in this society but they want to find their own way without having to give up the things that they believe in. To compromise their own personal values that aren't necessarily the values of- Of general American society, conservative society, but Mm -hmm. it's a carnival on the beach. Right. In this vampire lair, they're down there. They're having a good time. We'll see them later partying. You and I hung out with a colorful crowd. And I always remember you and I, were the ones who used to just say no to drugs. I always thought to myself, well, me and Eric, me and Eric, I don't know if you realize that, but I, I always was like, Eric's my people. And it was like, my friends were doing all the things and it was cool. It was fine. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be involved. I was clean living. I was high on life. <laughs> I just didn't want to put that stuff in my body. I, I honestly, I, I just, I, I would just think in terms of healthy, like, and yeah, that's just legit. It just looks nasty. And I'd see my friends kind of like screw around and yeah. it would make me laugh. I'm like, eh, I'll just live vicariously through, through their actions. I can be here. I can be in this environment. It's all good. There's no judgment here, but like, I don't want to do it for me. It's just not my yeah. vibe. So yeah, we cut to Sam's at home in his room, <laughs> his room that has a Rob Lowe poster. <laughs> Did you see it? I didn't know it was Rob Lowe. I remember seeing like, I first I remember thinking, why is this kid got pictures of like half naked dudes like on his wall? But I thought, oh, wait a minute. 
I did too when I was that age, actually. I had like I had the Jim Morrison and I had like surfer guys like bearing their chests on their surfboards. I'm like, yeah, I did too. They were probably pro surfers. But to have Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe was huge in that in that time, though. Joel Schumacher said on the DVD commentary that the poster was there because he had just directed him like a few years before in uh, St. Elmo's Fire in 1985. So oh. it was kind of just like a little nod to Rob, like, eh. oh. I see you, boo. Sam's in his room and he's reading his horror comic. Back at the lair, it is feeding time. Michael is offered Chinese food, like rice, and he looks at it and it's maggots and he drops it. I remember this scene really, really clearly. I think everybody who's seen that movie, this is a scene, it sticks in your head. For sure. Because we've all seen vampire movies. If you've seen this one, you've seen a dozen others and they're all, they have a lot of similar qualities, but man, this particular scene, there's an innate fear built into people about what we eat. What are we actually ingesting and putting in into our body? The food things that you that you are eating, that is like a natural horror. Like, what are you putting in your body that's going to be part of you from now on? Like, really, that could be part of you for the rest of your life. You know, once you digest it, it's breaking down and and it's building like building blocks into your into your cell system. Yeah, when I saw the scene with the maggots and the worms, that was mortifying. And I, I will firmly say that that's one of the most mortifying scenes I've seen in any movie. And I really do believe anybody who's seen this movie will will know that scene exactly and will remember it, like what happens. And it's interesting that you say that, like that fear of like what I ingest becomes part of me because then they offer him the wine. You know, they're saying like, drink this, Michael, be one of us. And the gang is chanting his name and stars like, don't do it. It's blood. And he's like, yeah, right. And he drinks it. (laughs) You say, yeah, right. But blood has a very distinct taste. Clearly he knew from the minute he tasted it. Oh, this isn't wine. It's blood. And he just continues to drink it. And this is when, you know, everything turns like real slow-mo and super moody and, and the Gothic rock song, Cry Little Sister plays. And, and now they're partying and things are getting a little bit dark and funky. But I mean, he made that conscious choice. He could have tasted it and spit it out and been like, what are you guys doing to me? No, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to take the opposite point of view on that respectfully, because I, I can, Please I, I do. Can see that. I, that scene to me was believable. In, in the position he's in, he already like came along with this gang, which that was the point that I that I found disbelievable as we as we discussed. But at this mo- moment, he gave in to peer pressure. And I feel that is very natural because obviously he's down here now. He's already surrendered to these guys. He wants to be part of their clique. At this point, the peer pressure is immense. He's already started kind of joking with them. He Kiefer Sutherland's put his arm around him. He said, Come on, buddy. We're just kind of goofing around. Be one of us. Be one of us. I feel that it's natural for Jason Patrick to take the drink. But secondly, to your point, I don't think that it tastes like blood. Because as Kiefer Sutherland said, remember, Jason Patrick ate the rice and it was totally normal rice. He ate it just, it tasted like rice. It looked like rice. All senses said it was rice. But then Kiefer Sutherland says, oh, it's maggots. And then we do the pull away. And then Patrick's like, Oh my God, how did I not know I was eating maggots? And he spits it all out. It's the same way that okay. someone says we, we can, we can control like your senses. So based on that's like the little rule that they put into play. So I firmly believe that yes, he can drink the blood and feel like, and think that it is the actual taste just of normal red wine. And really it's still at this point, he doesn't know what's going on because Kiefer Sutherland is just like, they're messing with him. They're like, is it rice? Is it maggots? Is it rice? <laughs> oh, ha, ha. we're just joking with you, buddy. It's really rice. Look. And then they're eating it. And so Jason Patrick's like, well, I see you guys are eating and drinking it. So obviously. Like you wouldn't be eating maggots and yeah, worms. You guys, you guys wouldn't be doing it. So why is it in my, in my mind, you're just like doing some like mental trick on me, some hypnosis to make me think this. But, it, but also this is a challenge. Not only is he giving to the peer pressure. But it's like, I'm not going to let you fool me again. You fooled me with the rice and with the okay. worms. Ah, oh, bro, dude, come on now. I'm one of you guys, dude. You ain't going to mess with me anymore. And now he's going to take the red wine. It tastes like the red wine. 
it's more of like the male bonding and dominance rather than like the little the warning of the girl because you're, you're okay. a bunch of guys you got to impress dude that's a big issue to step back and say oh the girl is telling me not to yeah i'm gonna listen to her instead of you guys so now i've just surrendered my masculinity and i lose for all like future challenges from this point on you're right. It probably didn't taste like blood. Yeah. But let's talk about Cry Little Sister. This is a song by Gerard McMahon. It's the theme for the movie. It was written for the film. And he never saw a frame of the film. He just read the script. And this is what came out. The song has been sampled by Eminem and Joe Budden. And it's been covered by uh, Charlie Sexton, L.A. Guns, and the problematic Marilyn Manson. It's a good song. It holds up. It yeah, I, you know, I had real mixed feelings on, on the music of the movie. Really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, in general, the songs are just the synth rock scene. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was the time, though, you have to remember. But that wasn't my, t- I didn't like that. I liked grunge rock and I liked classic rock. Okay. I liked, like, the guitars and the drum solo and, like, loud vocals. Synth rock. It's always guys kind of whispering. It's moody. Or like very high pitch. It's very atmospheric and very moody. Absolutely. But I, I like it. I mean, it fit, it, that's why I say I have mixed feelings. It fits. I loved In Excess. In Excess was one of my favorite yes, bands. Yes, they have a few songs on this album. Echo and the Bunny Man are amazing. And the, mm-hmm. the Doors that you said. And there's a lot of cool other artists involved. I think Lou Graham was involved and Roger Daltrey from The Who. But it didn't do it for you. It did it for me. I loved it. Actually, ever since I watched this film for this episode, I've been listening to the soundtrack and I'm here for it. I, I like the synth. And, and, you know, there's a lot of like organ music in it. It's really like. Yeah, that's, that's kind of hectic. If I have my choice of like organ music or Metallica, <laughs> I'm just like the louder sounds. That's so funny. So the vampires then decide they're going to go out and show Michael a good time. Like, hey, let's hang under a railroad bridge in the fog for funsies. And a train comes. Michael is scared as hell. The rest of them are just laughing and having a good time. And one by one, they begin to let go. And they're just swallowed by the fog beneath them. And David tells them, you're one of us, Michael. And he drops and Michael's so scared and like, crap, I have to hang on. And he's losing his grip and he falls, but he wakes up in his bed the next morning, hung over as hell with no clue as to how he got home. So now Michael is in his bedroom. His eyes are so sensitive to sunlight. He has to wear sunglasses now. He's also wearing a dangle earring. I was like, oh, when did that happen? (laughs) I mean, did they pierce you? I thought that too. I remember the scene where he was where he, where he first like was talking to Star at when right. to get their, their ear pierced. And she's like, I can pierce you. She said that. Bet you it was on the cutting room floor. So he wakes up yeah. with an earring. Okay, fine. So his mom calls home from work and says, like, you have to watch Sam tonight. I'm gonna go out on a date with Max. And it's now nighttime, and Michael is still wearing his sunglasses. Very, very Corey Hart. Like, what's another Corey? <laughs> Sunglasses indoors and Corey's, they, they just go together. I, I got to back up though for a moment. Yeah. Because I got to get this off my chest. Tell me. First, first of all, hanging off of the railroad bridge like that for Michael, that was like point two. I could not suspend my disbelief. <laughs> I could see the other vampires doing it because they're immortal. But dude, if you're a normal person, you, you've committed yourself to hang out with a rough crowd and you've already gone on this adventure. But this is a whole nother level of like craziness of insanity. Like, am I really going to hang off of a cliff, like holding on to the railroad tiers? Like, and then, so they start dropping off one by one. All right, now Michael's scared. He tries to get up. Obviously in real life, that's impossible to climb up. Of course. And he falls. What just happened? He wakes up in his bed. How can he not have a memory? Okay. So this is what I think happened. He's super drunk and under some weird voodoo oh, vampire spell. I can buy that. Okay. 
all of his decisions thereon are, are based off of the wine, the blood wine of messed up his, his thought Yeah, process. it's like Michael's not making good choices. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's accurate, but I like that. And I, I'm, I'm totally buying into that like 110%. When he fell, I like to believe the vampires were waiting and they swooped and gathered him and safely deposited him into yeah. his bed. In their loving arms. Loving immortal arms. I think that's what <laughs> happened. So okay. this is actually the scene that I have trouble buying into. Little Sam, who's in high school, presumably, right? He's in the bathtub getting squeaky clean. I had a <laughs> real problem with this scene. And just like rocking out by himself, like singing out loud to the microphone. <laughs> okay, so there is a whole bottle of Mr. Bubble in there because there are so many bubbles and he's playing in there like a freaking toddler he's got his comb <laughs> and he's combing his hair into a little mohawk and he's having so much fun in the bubbles and he's singing and and partying by himself in the bathtub like no teenage boy <laughs> does that like i can barely get my teenager to take uh, a shower i'm just saying the fact that he's taking a bath on his own too like She's not even home, right? And then is he like, oh, I'm going to make myself a bubble bath. Like, this is just not a thing that happened. So it was really stupid. <laughs> His dog's in there hanging out in a nook. Did you notice like the transistor radio he's rocking out to? It's plugged into the electrical socket oh, and just shit. right there on the edge of the bathtub. You know. And how many horror movies, like movies like, oh, I knocked the radio into the bathtub and got a like this is a real danger i don't understand in the first place why people would even do that why don't you place the radio just on the other side you could hear it just as well <sighs> you know the people of santa carla aren't making good choices eric <laughs> so michael's like not feeling well but he goes to get milk from the fridge and he doubles over in pain meanwhile sam is still upstairs playing in the bathtub <laughs> michael makes that very slow predatory walk up the stairs. Their house is so dark. That's part of the, the hippie bohemian uh, living. He walks up the stairs to his brother in the tub. And Michael now has this thirst for blood. And he opens the door and he goes to attack Sam, who is now underwater playing under the bubbles. Nanook is there and he attacks him. He ends up getting bit by Nanook. And Sam comes up out of the water like, what just happened? What's going on? Gets out of the tub to find that Michael has been bit by the dog. Sam's like, Michael, there's something wrong with you. Like, look at your reflection in the mirror. Yeah, that was a cool visual. Like that the yes. half reflection. So Sam's like, you're a vampire, Michael. My own brother, a goddamn shit sucking vampire. <laughs> uh, what a great line. <laughs> shit sucking. <laughs> yes. He locks Michael out of his room and he calls the frog brothers and they're like, stake him through the heart. He's like, he's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's what gave the movie heart or things like that, because it makes sense from like the kid's point of view, like the frog brothers. All you have to do to kill a vampire is just put a stake through his heart. It's so Bro, easy. It's so easy. But then you think in real life, oh my gosh, there's so many like ethical and moral decisions to do such a thing. But then even just from Corey Haynes, like very pragmatic point of view as a kid like he's my brother i can't do anything my mom will ground me i can't kill my brother my, my older brother i've looked up to my whole life it was really funny and it helps sort of cut the tension too like yes just when you think like oh it's all becoming too much something ridiculous happens and you're like okay okay this is not quite so scary but it maintains a good balance it's and it's natural reactions. It humanizes the characters at that moment because it's so believable. And that's why you kind of laugh along because that's what we would say. <laughs> so Michael goes to the lair for help from Star. And what do you know? Their sexual chemistry is just so undeniable, Eric. Oh, so she doesn't help him. They just have sex because that'll fix it. They were marketing to the right audience for that scene. They're two ridiculously good looking people. Anything goes, you know, if anything else would have occurred at that moment, we all would have just thrown up our hands and said, you know what, why didn't they go at it? Yes. Like, I think it was good for the film. It didn't feel necessarily disingenuous, but if you were truly scared. I can see that you're, you're, they're scared together. That's, a, that's an outlet for their passions and their fears because they're scared. They're both in the same position now. They both want to be rescued, but they don't really know what to do. 
So they find this uh, unity with, with themselves. Okay. Okay. Well, it's a sexy scene. It works in the film. It didn't feel gratuitous. I mean, yeah. yeah. By now, Sam and the Frog Brothers have figured out that Michael is only a half vampire. And that's because he hasn't killed anybody yet. So there's only one way to reverse this. Because if Sam can't kill Michael, because it's his brother, they need to kill the head vampire. So the question is, who's the head vampire? So Sam thinks Max is the head vampire. So with the help of the Frog Brothers, they're going to test this theory. They find out Max is invited to dinner, and that evening at dinner, Sam offers him Parmesan cheese, which is really garlic, to see if he has some sort of reaction. Uh, He does not. He isn't repelled. He doesn't melt down. You know, nothing happens. Okay. Sam splashes him with water to see if he'll melt. No, that doesn't happen. And so Max passes all the tests. So the head vampire, it can't be Max. It must be David. It's a funny scene. I mean, it's ridiculous. Who doesn't recognize like, oh yeah, this is supposed to be Parmesan cheese, but it's really cubed garlic. Like, right, like that would be the most fragrant thing at the table. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael confronts David at the boardwalk looking for Star. And David tells him, if you ever want to see Star again, you need to go with us. And this is when they hide in the shadows and they watch that group of crazy beachgoers that you said deserve to die, Eric, (laughs) partying on the beach. And this is when we see like shots of the vampires, like their weird eyes and they're getting those like crazy cheekbones and their vampire teeth and they're getting real scary. And hey, it's time for a feeding frenzy. And Michael watches as the vampires descend and and michael's not looking good he's shaking he, like bro needs to eat and um yeah i mean that's kind of how i feel when i'm on a diet too <laughs> oh yeah i'm on weight watchers right now i'm hangry as Those hell. vampires are hangry michael does not attack he resists temptation for the first time ever michael resists temptation <laughs> <laughs> which is really weird because now he has like He's in the drugged blood state, but suddenly now he can resist peer pressure. Yes. Maybe that's the benefit. The the blood has like changed his personality. So now it's given him this like inner strength. Now he makes smart choices. To follow his own path. He doesn't actually see the vampires. They are. They represent good in like <laughs> some twisted way. I'm telling you. That's like you were so there's like, come on, bro, be one of us. We're part of the vigilante crowd. We're just we're just trying to do the best that we can here, you know? Yes. If the world oh is God. out to get us. We're cleaning up Santa Carla. Come help us. Yes. He resists. He goes home. A star shows up and she reveals, like, oh Michael, you were supposed to be my first kill the night we slept together, and I'm half vampire too, and and I don't want this life. And Michael is getting progressively weaker. This is when he leads Sam and the Frog Brothers into the vampire cave. And the vampires are in there just sleeping upside down with their gross vampire feet. <laughs> and the kids impale one of the vampires. There's just glittery blood it everywhere. It did have glitter in it. That was weird. So according to trivia on IMDb, in the documentary Blood Sucking Cinema, all the blood had glitter in it to give it a shimmering effect. And according to Corey Haim, it was slimier than other fake blood. So it did have glitter in it. I mean, it's it's a stylized choice, right? Yeah. Like if the film is supposed to have like this real edgy style to it, like I I get it. Yeah. Joel Schumacher said Vampires are hot. They're the only erotic monsters. Frankenstein is not hot. This was why he wanted to do the film because he thought like vampires are sexy. This is erotic and sexy. And I'm going to make the film more adult for this reason. I would argue werewolves are a little, little sexier because they, they give into like the primal urges. And- yeah, I could see that. You know, I don't think about werewolves very often. They're off my radar. I wouldn't have thought of it. You can make any monster. You're the bride of Frankenstein. She's shown as being sexy all the time. Oh, is she? I didn't even know that. Is she hot? Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Oh, hot. OK. So all the drama of the vampire getting staked, you know, David wakes up. He is pissed. And the boys are struggling to escape while they're trying to rescue Star and Laddie from, you know, the evil den of horror. So 
it's all very dramatic. And I have to say this scene in particular was so awesome because when David grabs hold, I think it's of Sam. Is it of Sam? And he's trying to pull him back in. Oh, he grabs his ankle. Yes. Grabs his ankle. Right. And we see David shed a tear, that single tear. Did you clock that? Yeah, I clocked it. In reality, that tear was not planned. The hard contacts that these guys had to wear in their vampire look were super painful. And they could only be worn for like a very limited amount of time because everyone was just in so much pain. Their eyes were killing them. And that tear was a tear because Kiefer Sutherland's eyes were so uncomfortable. Oh man, dude, that was that was such a meaningful moment. Marco the Vampire, played by Alex Winter. We didn't talk about him, like, you know, Bill and Ted, blah, blah, blah. So he got killed. And so that tear, my friend Marco is dead. I totally took it that way too. Yes. I, and of course, it happened right after his hand was burned from the flame on the sun. So you, you could say like, <laughs> oh, the tear is caused by the, the physical reaction. But I, I always just assumed it was because his good friend Marco just got brutally butchered in their yes. sleep. And that showed the humanity of the vampires. Up until this point, they're always just this kind of ruffian gang of no goods, <gasps> like fighting society or maybe being the vigilante crowd, like saving the day for everybody. But in either case, you've never seen like a humanity side of them. But at this moment, suddenly you're like, dude, the vampires have real feelings. They have hearts and they they actually do care for other people. But now you're like, it was an accidental tear. It wasn't meant to be like that. I'm like, oh man, no, they're just like monsters all along. Vampires don't have hearts. (laughs) No. So the director saw it and liked it. And I think he was smart enough to realize, oh, this does add a layer of humanity to this <laughs> character. Totally that you have to have that scene. Which really backs your theory that the vampires were maybe the good guys. Look, the Frog Brothers. <laughs> Nobody's crying in any of this. They're, they're out for vampire blood. Dude, seriously, the Frog Brothers are these punk kids riding around with weapons. Yeah, what they're, the- they're like junior high kids. They're like, yeah, that's okay. These kids are just cool, like riding around with weapons and just deciding who they're going to just going to kill because they read too many comic books. Eric, it was the 80s. That shit happened all the time. <laughs> uh, it's a wonder any of us survived, honestly. <laughs> the 80s or that was a crazy. I feel like like a Vietnam veteran, like talking about like, <laughs> hey, I was battling Charlie back in Saigon. Like, dude, when I, I was in junior high during the 80s, it was a crazy time, man. You just don't know unless you were there. It's the glue that holds Gen X together, <laughs> honestly. It is. So at this point, the boys escape. They all know David and his gang will be coming that night to murder them all. And so they need to take action. They don't have a lot of time. Nightfall is coming. And the teens devise a plan. Okay, we're going to fill these water guns with holy water. We're going to, you know, gather all of our weapons together. We have stakes and bows and all the things. They fill the bathtub at home with garlic and water. They showed the scene where the kids burst into that little, um, like the baptism in the Catholic church. Yeah. And we're taking a little bit of holy water and filling it in their canteens and pedaling off. How did they get so much holy water into the bathtub? I think the bathtub was just filled with water and they put garlic in in it. I think they use the holy water for the water guns. But they showed them taking the water out of the bathtub to put into the water guns. Oh, they did. Yeah. Maybe they had a priest come to the house in a cut scene and bless the water in the tub. Yeah, I was thinking like, well, maybe they just mix, like you turn on the bathtub, you can mix holy water. It's it's a little diluted with the regular tap water. I don't know. Can you? Our listeners can get back to us on that. I'll put up a poll on Instagram and ask if holy water works that way. You guys can let me know. Let's let's TikTok that. Yeah, yeah, we have questions. Okay, so night comes. Lucy goes out on her date with Max. You know, the teens are waiting for the battle of their lives. David and the crew, they descend onto the house. There's a struggle. The boys push one of the vampires into the tub. The dog pushed him into the tub. I wrote that they managed to push him in the tub, but yeah, they weren't that good. The dog they got they got him lined they got him lined up, and then there's the slow-mo picture of the husky, like out of nowhere coming in, just jumps up and shoves the vampire in. You're like, the doggy saves the day. 
Nanook is always on the right side of things. So I'm going to trust Nanook's judgment on this. The vampires were bad. I'm back to my original theory. And seeing the vampire like dissolve in the tub, that was really gruesome. There was like smoke, bloody water. It's splashing everywhere. Pipes are bursting throughout the house with bloody water. Why are the other sewage parks like downstairs? Like all of a sudden, like the water's coming out of the, out of the toilet. You're like, I can see the vampire dissolving in the holy water, but how does the pressure of that like I work its way know. down through the entire like sewage pipes and then come out with all the other pipes? Eric, I don't know a lot about plumbing. Okay, I'll just start right there. But I will say the tub was plugged because the water was not draining. So how this thing happening in the tub. How does it translate? To- how? Yeah, that water was not like now suddenly acid vampire water down through the pipes that then started like corroding through the pipes and up through the sinks and downstairs in the kitchen. It's like murder scene with like yeah every every drain and outlet in the house is just geysering it's like niagara falls it's so vampire blood disgusting yeah and then oh when the vampire like comes up from the water and it's like skeleton like oh my god it was so gross it's such a true horror scene and a vampire attacks sam sam is able to shoot him through the heart with an arrow the vampire falls back into the stereo behind him and it's instantly electrocuted by all that stereo equipment, like loud music starts playing. The wattage of that stereo, dude, that must have been like a 220, like double wired up. Like it's just like this little normal stereo and you're like, <laughs> all right, the the blade of the, the arrowhead somehow went through and like cause this massive, massive electrical storm in the house. It looks like the 4th of July behind him. There's like sparks <laughs> everywhere. And this is when Sam gives the famous line, death by stereo. Oh, yeah. That, that was a good one. Yeah. By the way, I don't if have you if you've ever done archery before, dude, that kid had the fastest shot because <laughs> his first shot he tried you you saw him like lining up the bow and like pulling it back and like shooting up the arrow at the vampire and then, and then afterwards the vampire pops up he's like you missed and then sam's <laughs> like guess what i got another one and like all of a sudden out of nowhere he's got another like he he notches up an arrow in like the fastest speed you've ever seen i mean katniss could never do totally yeah yeah i know 14 year old sam Bam, dude, done. 14 year old Sam, lover of Rob Lowe, does not know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and comic book enthusiast. Yes. This is when David confronts Michael and says, I tried to make you immortal. And Michael says, You tried to make me a killer. And David says, You are a killer. And both of them, they're like, Vampire eyes are bugging out. They're all like vamped out. And David says, join us. And Michael says, never. And David attacks. And somehow Michael is able to muster enough strength to push him with full force into grandpa's taxidermy antlers hanging on the wall. Boom. And the antlers go straight through his body. And they're all like, yes, awesome. Yes. Our work here is done. We are victorious. And then they realize that Michael, Star, and Laddie are still half vampires, which means, oh shit, David was not the head vampire. Okay, what were your thoughts on this scene? Like, did you find David's death a little anticlimactic? If if he would have been the last villain and Max didn't come along, it would have been anticlimactic. But because there was the twist that Max comes along later, I feel that the pacing was good for it. The tension, the pacing, it was good. I just felt like David really is like the star of the vampires at this point. And his death, it wasn't super spectacular. It seemed kind of easy. It, there was no like bloody bathtub craziness scene. Oh, yeah. He didn't get After the other two. Yeah, it wasn't cute. death by stereo for these <laughs> unknown vampires. Like he just got impaled by some antlers on a wall. Like it was a little anticlimactic. I have to say. There was no great one-liner that came after this. Like I'm telling them, hey buddy, why don't you stick around? <laughs> you know, some, some like little like great line, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of a line or something. It didn't feel like a 
enough to me. Like there was no glitter. It wasn't a sexy, spectacular death. Yeah, you know what? You're right. Because when Marco died and he was impaled, he exploded blood. That glitter blood went everybody. When Kiefer Sutherland died. It was super vanilla. It was like he was a regular human that got impaled. Huh. I expected more. That does seem uh, a little underwhelming. And yeah. You know, in retrospect. you know, my biggest point of contention with, with that whole scene, though, was ra- rather than the fight scene and the death, it was Kiefer Sutherland's line like, join us, Michael. <laughs> At this point, you're still asking him to join you? Like, and who's us, by the way? Unless you're counting Max, all of the other vampires are dead. You've watched this guy that you kind of like took under your wing and you maybe you were planning to have Star kill. And he still hooked up with your girlfriend instead and then came and like killed your friend and he led these other kids to your lair. Why do you want him? Are you really at this point still saying, bro, come on, man. I'm still giving you a chance. Don't you see this? Like, man, why don't you see things my way and just join to be a vampire with me? Even though all my other homies are like easily, you know, murdered and it's maybe not like the lifestyle that you want. We learn in the next scene that it was his direct order from Max. This is why he's still wanting him to come. Like, yeah, all my friends are dead. But my boss, head guy Max, told me I have to get these brothers. So you th- you think Kiefer Sutherland is still just following orders? Like following good, orders. Just a good soldier? Like, there is a hierarchy in vampire. His, his rebel image be damned. He's just a foot. He's just a foot soldier. That's all he is. Still. That's all he yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, could, I, I could see that because they give no other justification or explanation in the scene. But no. it still seems to go against his character. It does. I mean, because his character is far more dynamic. Lucy comes home from her date with Max. And she's like, what is going on here? The house. <laughs> like, let's talk about the state of the house in this moment. Like, you need to burn that mother effort down. <laughs> There's blood and gore literally everywhere. Like, everywhere. Blood. And so she comes in like, what is going on? And then this is when Max says, Sorry, David and my boys misbehaved. Okay. And he tells them, don't ever invite a vampire into your house, silly boy. It renders you powerless. And this is why he was able to pass all their earlier vampire tests. Max is the head vampire. He was invited into their home. They could do whatever they want. And none of those little tricks, none of those vampire tricks are going to work on him. So Max reveals, look, David was supposed to make Michael and Sam vampires so Lucy could come along and be unable to resist all of this and be the mom to my lost boys. Now they're like, shit, we have a head vampire in our house. We thought we were done. We're not. Just then when they're like, what are we going to do? How how are we going to fix this? Max pulls Lucy to him to take a giant bite out of her neck. She gives in pretty fast, too, She by does. The way, she doesn't that. really fight him off. I'm like, I think Lucy kind of wants to cross over to the dark side. She didn't seem to put up a fight at all. But what is weirder is that Grandpa drives his Jeep through the house, and he is able to... Wait, does he have something on the front of the of the Jeep that impales him? Because it showed him in the earlier scene um, putting in fence posts. So he Oh, yes, it was a fence, fence post. post. Thank so you, they, I they forgot. Expl- they explained that. At least they gave an explanation of why he has these giant spiked logs on his truck. They're like, <laughs> would it have hurt them to do a five-second scene of showing Sam practicing archery at some point? That would have gone so, that would have like saved the story right there. I don't understand though. When Grandpa drives the Jeep into the house and has those wooden fence post and impales Max through the heart. Max explodes. He has a spectacular death. He was impaled. And yet, poor David. I don't mind it because the Frog Brothers did have that classic line of every vampire dies differently. Some Okay, that's true. Some explode. Some go out silent. So they're all different. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. That's cool with me. Okay. Okay, fine. But like, how was Grandpa... Yeah, First oh, of all, yeah. able to know this. That's Secondly, ridiculous. able to drive through a wall and he doesn't know where anything is. He doesn't know what's happening. Drives through a wall, impales the vampire, somehow miraculously does not hurt his daughter in any way. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt anybody. None of, nobody else is hurt. And yeah, like lucky shot. 
And just then Michael Starr and Laddie become normal human beings again. Talk to me about this. Oh, I'm so angry. I feel like I'm, so, I, I'm still pissed. I'm sorry. I feel like when you're, I apologize. You're explaining it. And I think I was already like starting to fume over that scene. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, your, your blood was getting hot. You're getting mad. Dude, the straight up absurdity of the moment. It doesn't make sense. I'm shaking my desk and pounding my fist in fury at this moment. Because as you said, there's no signs of battle on the outside. Like everything that happened in, well, I think the vampires actually, technically, they did shatter through a window. Okay, so like a burglar could have done that. Maybe there's a broken window and he's an old grandfather. He's not like this like skilled soldier or he's or a detective where he's looking at every clue. He's this crazy old taxidermist grandfather. The bloody water is like flooding the house. Maybe when he pulled up, there was just bloody water. Like the house was just bleeding. Yeah, you know, we all actually, if, if we're if we're going like with the speculative backstories or things that aren't happening, <laughs> they are happening, Eric. If only in our imagination, they're happening right now, <laughs> right this very moment. They are going on still, but maybe Grandpa actually he rolled up a lot earlier. Maybe he was oh. watching them. We don't know that he didn't came up earlier. Maybe he was coming up, but he's an old man. He knows he can't be involved in the fight. He he doesn't have any weapons. He's peeping them through like some little little hidey hole because he's secretly a creepo as it is. So he's got all these little (gasps) spy holes where he can spy on people. He's a voyeur. He's a total, oh, that guy's totally a voyeur. If ever there was a voyeur, it is grandpa from, from Lost Boys. Dude, that guy fits the stereotype to a T. So maybe he's been watching the whole time and then his daughter comes in and he's like, dude, that's the last straw because these other, these young whippersnappers, they look intimidating because look how they're dressed with their fingerless like gloves and their, and their dangle earrings, their crazy hair. And like, like, dang, these kids are like drug dealers and they're like monsters. But the final straw is, oh, this guy, Max, he's the clean cut vision. I would love my daughter to like be married with that guy's a vampire. And he's dating my daughter. He's like, oh, I I can't hold on anymore. And then he totters back to his like flatbed truck with like the stakes. He's like, I'm going to take care of business. Once Max like enters the room and gives the big speech about his boys. Yes. He really never moves. He stays in the same place right there in the middle of the living room. And he's big. He's a big dude. He's kind of an easy target to hit. So technically, maybe grandpa sees him in the middle of the living room, (laughs) has enough time to get back to his car and grandpa has time to like rev up the engine and then drive straight into where he saw Max was. How did Lucy not get hit? He pulled her up right next to him. Yeah, that grandpa almost killed his own daughter. That's like the lottery. It it can never be, it can never be replicated, but maybe in one instance, in like the history of the universe and vampire battles, everything just goes your way. And you just I have mean, to drive at the right speed through a wall blindly and knock out the vampire. Eric, and your daughter it could is happen. Her. It did happen. Yeah. It yeah. happened. And the next part is <laughs> the actual best. Okay. So grandpa, just like uh, moseys into his blood soaked home, opens the fridge and just covered it. <laughs> <laughs> I got my trusty root beer. Yeah. Pulls out a drink and says ever so casually. Uh, One thing about living in Santa Carla, I never could stomach all the damn vampires. See, now, Lori, doesn't that imply there's more vampires than it implies there's more vampires? In fact, it makes me truly wonder. Is grandpa somehow mixed into this vampire world? Is he really the head vampire? Yeah, I thought that if they were going to go there, like they were going to have more to that scene just kind of ended right there. But I thought uh, I was expecting there to like kind of continue. And then the, and there's going to be this mind blowing twist that the grandpa was also like Jason Patrick, some sort of half vampire, but he had learned to live with it. He had the vampire blood. And that's why he's so kooky and crazy too. And that's how he had the weird, like freaking Spidey sense to know exactly how to kill Max. Exactly. Because all the vampires have this kind of connection and they can yes. sense each other. But yeah, no, that had nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. Fade to black. The end. People are strange. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was 
it, it's a funny line. Like you yes. laugh at it and then it's totally. over and you're like, uh, 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 okay, I, I guess. <laughs> like I'm still trying to good, good guys, good guys win, bad guys die. You're like, all right. I always like to talk about Roger Ebert because he never likes the movies right. that like the general public likes. It's very rare, in fact. So he gave the Lost Boys two and a half stars. He said, there's some good stuff in the movie, including a cast that's good right down the line and a willingness to have some fun with teenage culture and the mass murder capital. But when everything is all over, there's nothing to leave the theater with. No real horrors, no real dread, no real imagination, just technique at the service of formula. Hmm. As a writer, especially of horror and speculative fiction, I mean, what are your thoughts? I thought this movie had huge imagination. I could agree with him on his first parts of his of his review, kind of uh-huh. walking away like, yeah, there's really not a lot of substance to the movie. There's not really a lot of, of true horrors. You're not going to walk out of the movie and be scarred for life because the movie was made to be fun. But I would wholeheartedly disagree that it lacks imagination. imagination. This movie was incredibly imaginative and it was imaginative because they had fun with it. In his own review... He even said they're having fun with teen culture. When you poke fun at anything in the moment of satire, you're using your imagination. You're not just looking at things like, here's how normal culture has defined it. Here's how society has defined it. And I'm rebelling against it. You're poking fun at it. But the movie was filled with just imaginative and, and creative tidbits. They took a lot of traditional vampire lore and they twisted it. They made their own mythology. They involve jokes. They involve comics. To his point, the visual techniques kind of, it helped to save the movie because there was just so much eye candy happening. But man, that movie had so much heart and imagination. It was just, it was a fun, memorable movie. It was very memorable. And people to this day, when they think about horror movies of of their youth, I mean, we're talking about this, what, 30 years later on a podcast because it spoke to our imagination and it is very memorable not to the points of horror, but to the points of fun. And it was a very like, it was a culturally defining movie for us. Absolutely. And I think too, the film, I think holds such a special place in pop culture because it doesn't take itself too seriously. It pokes fun at itself in a way that feels relatable to everybody, Mm -hmm. you know, ages, adolescent kid to an older adult and really not, not really be scared. Yeah. So in terms of legacy, IndieWire said the idea of vampires appealing to teens, now something worth billions of dollars, can be traced directly back to one film, Joel Schumacher's 1987 film, The Lost Boys. When you think about the Buffy of it all, yes, the Buffy, the Twilight, it really all began right here with The Lost Boys. Yeah. Ridiculously good looking people. All of the people are like so good looking. They are. And they all have those like chiseled cheekbones and like whether they're good guys or they're bad guys and yeah it comes back here to the lost boys it's it's a it's a war of youth cultures yes it it was a vibe of defiance but it was done it was shot so very seductive that's the word it birthed a phenomenon And I touched on it earlier. There were two sequels, The Lost Boys, The Tribe in 2008. Corey Feldman was in it. So was Corey Haim and Angus Sutherland, who is the half-brother of Kiefer. And Lost Boys, The Thirst in 2010, which also starred Feldman. The Lost Boys spawned two comic book series and a television series that they are still trying to get off the ground. This has been happening for years. <laughs> They're trying to make it happen. But what's super cool is in 2019, Monopoly Events hosted their annual horror convention, and it included the biggest Lost Boys reunion ever. Oh, that would have been so awesome to attend. Let's see, <laughs> who was there? Uh, Keeper Sutherland, Jason Patrick, Alex Winter... Tim Capello was there. He performed. You can see the performance <laughs> on YouTube. But overall, a super fun rewatch. So fun to watch close to Halloween. Mm-hmm. So you, Eric, you are deeply involved in the literary culture of horror, speculative fiction. Tell me a little bit about what that's like. 
Oh, sure, I am an auteur. In the indie realm, so I, I wish I could say I was more more widely published in the, the author or known world worldwide. I gotta stop you. You know what, Eric? I'm sorry. <laughs> For the listener, you guys probably ought to know Eric J. Gennard is a big freaking deal. He has won two Bram Stoker Awards. You guys, that is the highest literary award of horror fiction. He's won two of them. He's been a finalist for the International Thriller Writers Award and has been a multi-nominee for the Pushcart Prize. He has over a hundred stories. He has edited a ton of anthologies. I mean, Eric's a really big deal. So whatever he tells us, he is the expert (laughs) in this realm. So what's it like? I'm going to say I've also dabbled a little bit in mystery writing and science fiction writing, children's writing, literary writing. I happen to like horror the most, but again, my my style of horror, I always liken it to the Twilight Zone. Okay. So the things that I write about, they're not generally just monsters versus people with big like bloodletting set scenes. They're typically more of just very subtle and quiet and weird psychological fears. So that, that's just kind of, I always kind of like justify like, ah, some people you get a bad reputation by saying you're a horror writer because it's like, ah, oh, it's just like on these monsters and torture scenes, which personally appalls me. I never, I never really liked that, but I am involved in that genre of writing and creative minds where I recognize other people are into that and I totally applaud them. It's just not my own particular style. So again, I, I always say I always like like more of like uh, Tales from the Dark Side and the modern anthology series on um, Black Mirror, kind of kind of things like that that just yes. turn reality a little a little on their its head. But with all that being said, man, the realm of horror writers are notoriously the nicest people you will ever ever come across for creative endeavors. In my experiences, and I, I've been doing writing for about ten years now. Dude, I, I come across this all the time where newer writers come in and I talk to them and I help mentor them or, you know, I just get in conversation and I talk about their own experiences and invariably they say, I can't believe how nice horror writers are with each other. When we get together in groups, we talk online, everybody is supportive of each other. I love that. I hate talking about myself and my own projects. I personally, I want to know what other people are working on. I love to hear of the creative endeavors of others going on around me. Like, man, what kind of a book are you doing? I love that idea. I love what you're doing. I didn't know this could be done. That's a really cool take on it. And you turn around and somebody else has a different outtake and a different perspective. And it really just kind of broadens your mind the more the more voices you talk to. But it's really a general sense across most horror writers is just, there's this joke that people that write horror, it's like self-therapy. So all of the fear, and I've done this personally, and a lot of actual real life tensions and psychological scars that I have for real life issues in my own life, I've been able to write those things out of my life through my writing. And it really gets a sense of relief, like, man, I, I've gotten this off my chest and I've, I've not had to go to a psychiatrist to like pay money for these things, but I've been able to write it in a way that it makes sense for a character and, it, and it's fiction, but I can make my voice heard in this context. And it's just one story of a thousand. And I look at things from, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tie in a little bit of real life in this story and this story and the next story is just totally make believe, but here in, I'm going to put, you know, here's another, like something I saw on the sidelines that I thought really strongly about, mm-hmm. But maybe I'm looking at an skewed opinion. What if somebody else's point of view was a little different from mine? And I'm going to explore it in the char- in a character study in this story. It's interesting to hear you say, like, you can sort of process through your own emotion for the harder things that you've had to endure in your life and leave elements of yourself behind in the context of these characters and different stories the processing of some of this stuff that you're talking about, this is really hard stuff. This is stuff that a lot of people never confront because it's too, it's too hard. It's Mm -hmm. too scary to think about, but within your writing, you're able to almost create like a safe space where it doesn't have to be so scary and it can be diluted through a variety of stories. And you can channel this stuff. You know, there's a plethora of scenarios and characters in which you can kind of work out these things that you're going through. And it is very therapeutic. I mean, I've always found writing to be 
the greatest form of personal therapy. And so where do you get your ideas? How do they come to you? Like anywhere, everywhere? Absolutely. Yeah. If you ask that question to a hundred different um, writers and not just writers, any creative person who they're going to say the same thing. You're never going to get one answer from one source. If they're prolific enough, nobody's going to say, I, I get every one of my ideas from this one can over mm-hmm. here. We all have limits to our own imagination. You bring in ideas from the world around you. I like to be well-read, so I read lots of other people's ideas and storylines. And that naturally triggers, as you and I have this conversation in the podcast, we had a lot of what-if scenarios. We say, what if the vampires are really the good guys? Well, guess what now? Because of that conversation now, I got an idea. I want to write a story about good guys who are misidentified as bad guys, but really they have like this optimal value, this very optimistic look at life. And they're trying to good, do good things. But that's what a lot of things, a lot of ideas come from conversations with others. You know, you watch the news naturally. Dude, the world around us is crazy. And it, well, it's, it's the insane. scariest place of all. <laughs> yeah, it's the scariest place. I get ideas from the news all the time. No, it doesn't matter what channel. If you're watching a news channel and just these crazy talking heads speaking about the most unbelievable conspiracy theories of the universe, you're like, man, nobody would believe that's a, that's a crazy, that's a crock. You're like, wait a minute. I got an idea though. I'm going to, I'm going to write about that. Sometimes you read really tragic things in the news that happen to, to children, diseases, murders, people create their own monsters, death and crime painful to read about those things. But then at the same time you read them, you're like, you know, I I got an idea. I'd like to incorporate that into a story. Mm -hmm. So ideas, literally they come from just the greater realm around you. So when you're writing, is this a opportunity then to explore some of those ideas and dig deeper? Because I know like you also run a small press called Dark Moon Books. So you are always, in addition to getting your inspiration from anywhere and everywhere, you're also helping other writers publish their work. You're reading what they do. I know you edit these big anthologies. And so you're getting material from people probably all over the world. Like you are exposed in a greater way than a lot of people normally would be. Yeah. I've always loved folklore Uh and fairy tales and mythology. Right. There are a lot of them are have morals to them. Yes. But because of my interest in in mythology, I love reading stories from other cultures. And I think that helps to get out of this bubble because typically a lot of anthologies or or stories, they tend to be similar viewpoints, which to be honest, we, we look at Hollywood movies and we always wonder like, why are the same movies rehashed over and over again? There's no unique ideas because the general audience have a set of expectations built in that they know what they like. Mm -hmm. They like to see the good guys win. They like to see these very vanilla characters because that's just kind of what they've been raised in. And once you start putting in the new crazy fresh ideas of Hollywood, you're really losing a very large percentage of, of viewership. And it goes the same with books. There's a certain percentage of people who, but when the latest inventions come out, they're the forerunners. They want to be the ones to try out the new invention, to be the ones to examine the, the latest in you know progressive literature or movies. But for the most part, you know, most people are going to sit back and say, ah, I, don't, I don't have the time or the energy or the, or the interest to, to pursue that. And they'll wait for the feedback to kind of start filtering in that, you know, a few years later, like, yeah, this is a really good invention. I'm going to jump on board with it now, or this is a, a good movie or, or thing. Do you find that that's a real freedom though in having a small press is that you aren't limited to a certain sort of mindset. You have the freedom to publish work that maybe otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to be published. And, And so you're not beholden to this sort of societal standard for what makes, you know, a best selling novel, you know, it doesn't maybe follow this particular formula. It's just a great story and it's thinking outside the box. And that's really the beauty of smaller presses. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. I feel so validated now with with (laughs) that explanation, but yeah, yeah, that's, it's basically, it's the spirit of indie independent entrepreneurship. I love Um, it. So Unfortunately, at the indie level, you never have big sales. No, nobody does. 
but we all know big ideas don't always yeah. equate to big sales. They just don't. That That's exactly it. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, you're at the indie level. Your hope is, you know, at some point I'll have a bigger audience. My voice will be amplified to showcase the message that, that I want to share. And it happens all the time. I have lots of indie friends that started off like myself, not knowing anybody in the industry, not doing anything, but Hey, all of a sudden they have a movie coming out on Netflix. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Because they, they had a story that they wrote and, you know, it went to the right person that was picked up. And now that author, they've been brought into the, the family of the big five publishing houses. The indie world opens up those opportunities in the age of self-publishing, it's amazing this outlet because you know, 15 years ago, print on demand didn't exist. So if I was an indie author and I wanted to write a book, I really had no outlet unless yes. I was knocking on other indie publishers' doors and like shoveling my wares onto them. And maybe an indie publisher might take notice because they're certainly not going to take notice at the big publishing level unless I have an in. Yep. Maybe I got a graduate degree and a professor will help me out, but for the most part, most writers, they, they would write in the confines of their house, but nobody's ever going to read them. With print-on-demand technology, that's that's changed so much. So you're able to get your voice out. There's a very gray area about what's considered legit for self-publishing um, and what's not. Um, some people have found immense success. So there's all kinds of these like millionaire stories of people who write like dinosaur pornography. What? Craziest thing. You're like, what? that's insane. But then when the word has gotten out, everybody's like, I want to buy a book on dinosaur pornography. I want to I want to know what's going on. And oh my Lord. I did not know this was a oh, thing. Yeah, totally. Look it up. Hashtag dino porn. <laughs> You shouldn't be surprised at anything that you hashtag these days. As I'm sure you're, you're well aware. But self-publishing is suddenly it's given an outlet for people to put out their big ideas. And, you know, some of the ideas, I, I take a step back and I kind of give it a one-eyed look. And I'm like, yeah, that really doesn't belong in the greater realm. That's that, that was better left in the shadows. Yeah, but, that okay. was better in your mom's basement. You know, take a, take a step back. But it does get the opportunity that there's so many wonderful, wonderful independent projects that have been able to get out there and make their voices heard. Now it does open the the doors for people if they work diligently enough, and I like to say respectfully enough, Yeah. but you like to think of over time, it's traditionally the slow growth and hopefully, hopefully it gets recognized and it gets rewarded in, in the long term. Absolutely. And for you guys listening, Eric has so much out there. I'm going to link to all of his stuff so you could check him out online. His latest books include Last Case at a Baggage Auction, Doorways to the Dead Eye, and That Which Grows Wild, 16 Tales of Dark Fiction. And Eric is all over the internet. He's at ericjgnard.com. He's got a blog at ericjgnard.blogspot.com. And check out his press, darkmoonbooks.com. So thank you so much for joining me, Eric. It was really, really fun to get together and talk about the Lost Boys with you of all people. So thank you so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure. And I would love to have you back. Let's do it again. Totally. Let, yeah, let's do it. And I really appreciate your time and the uh, invitation. Oh, thank you so much. And you guys, again, we'll put all of Eric's links in the show notes. Be sure to check them out. And thank you again for listening. I'd like to remind you to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on the web at the Untitled Gen X Podcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at the Untitled Gen X Podcast. We hope you keep in touch, beautiful people. Bye. Toodles!